Hi everyone, welcome back to Obscura Sloopa Presents. Let's see what happens in Rage and Honor 2. Quick recap of part one, Richard Norton plays Preston Michaels, an Australian cop who comes to America, gets framed for murder, and teams up with an inner city high school teacher to clear his name. Cynthia Rothrock is Chris Fairchild, said inner city high school teacher, who must fight her brother to avenge their sensei's death. She ends up thrown off of a roof, Preston kills her brother, and his name is never cleared so he has to leave the country. Cut to the sequel, and the two of them team up in Indonesia to fight a gang of money laundering criminals. If you're wondering if any of the issues from the first film are wrapped up, no. No, they aren't. So let's find out what happens with these two wacky kids. Oh, and by the way, Chris is training to be a government agent. Yeah, she went from a high school teacher to a government agent, and it only took an impossibly short amount of time! We open on Chris as she's trying to defuse a hostage situation, and she seems to be doing pretty well until this happens. Huh, well this was a short movie. Game over! Second team in! It was a training sequence? Well then, why did Chris have to play dead at the end? Oh yeah, to trick the audience. You got me! Also, is this what most government training facilities look like? Graffitied high school gyms filled with workout equipment? Anyway, Chris is called up to see her boss and finds out that her two years of training have paid off. She's gonna be put on an easy assignment at a bank! And the rest of the movie follows her new financial venture. The end. Okay, so that's not true, but she is sent to work at a bank, in Indonesia no less. Why? Because it's cheaper to shoot there. As if the fates have aligned, Preston also happens to be in Indonesia, in the same town, working as a bartender. At the bar, we meet up with... I don't know, goons I never bothered to learn the name of. The only one that has any distinguishing traits is the Australian guy in blue, so I'll just call him Blondie. He's mainly here because Norton needed an antagonist who's nearly identical to the one from the first film. And he's Australian, because, um... Richard Norton is. So Blondie and company are hassling one of the employees, Charlie, and trying to get him to pay them a protection fee. When he makes it clear that he's not interested by hitting their fists with his face, they get a visit from the Wonder from Down Under. He proceeds to kindly explain to them what they did wrong, and they have a discussion about violence, the state of the economy, and the weather. They all agree to have coffee together and become best friends, without any fighting or bloodshed. Meanwhile, we get to meet Chris's partner as he's investigating some money laundering at the bank. And seeing as how he's a peripheral character who knows Cynthia Rothrock, you know what that means! <laughs> Oh, I mean, a bomber, dude. He's then resurrected as a zombie and turns the criminals into zombies as well, creating an unstoppable money laundering zombie gang that Rothrock and Norton must fight. That, or he's just dead. <laughs> Later, Preston is leaving work when he's approached by Tommy Andrews, an out-of-towner who specializes in having an incredibly generic name and appearance. He asks Preston to teach him some more kickboxing moves, but he's refused because Preston has bartending to do. That is, until he creepily stalks him in the next scene and gets the crap beaten out of him in the boxing ring. <gasps> Wow, what a pussy. Okay, I'll train you. During training, we find out that Tommy McGeneric here came to Indonesia with his father to run his bank. Oh, um, gee whiz, I wonder if this relates to the plot. So yeah, his dad's working for the crime boss, Boon Tao. He demands to get a larger cut of the money for working with him. That's right. Diamonds. Diamonds! Half the diamonds! In order to save his ass from getting murdered, he blackmails Boontao with records of the criminal transactions. Boontao is not terribly happy with these new developments, so he conspires with Blondie to kidnap Tommy. Maybe then, Mr. Andrews will want to renegotiate his proposal. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe this training isn't going to work out after all. And that's how you hog a loogie. Is Sun Chin Kata. Sun means three. We're doing three battles. Oh my gosh, these training sequences are going on for forever. I wouldn't mind it so much if it had any relevance to the plot, but it really doesn't. It just sort of pads out the movie. Also, it would be nice if our main characters could finally meet. It's half an hour in already. Blondie and the others attempt to kidnap Tommy, but Preston steps in and hands their asses to them. So nice to see that the villains pose a real threat in this. Since they've wrecked Tommy's car, Preston gives him a lift home. Tommy convinces Preston to be his date at the party. Oh, but what will he wear? A motorcycle? How will he ever park that? Ooh. Foster's Australian for beer. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Michaels. This 
my dad. Wow, he's already introducing him to the parents? Moving a little quick, don't you think, Tommy? You better not get fresh with him. Perhaps as a cover-up for his true feelings, Tommy decides to hook Preston up with the new girl from work. Who is this new chick? Wah, 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 wah. Preston is glad to see Chris, but she pretends to not know him to keep her cover. Not sure why she's starting now, she didn't even bother to come up with a fake name for her secret government bake job. Thank goodness they moved three feet away, now no one will hear anything. Meanwhile, one of Boontow's rival gangs, led by someone named Dazzo, shoots some of his men with tomatoes, taking his cash. Boontow reacts as cartoonishly as possible. You let them get my money! <laughs> get the records! Get the kit! Stop at nothing! Fly, my pretty fly! Blondie decides to pay Preston a visit. Ha ha ha, now you've got to pay for those. Put them on the tab, eh? Let's see what you got. How's that? What, was he insulting his lack of a golden mane there? Once again, Blondie and his cohorts are defeated very easily, and they run away. Uh, you gotta love when the villains in your action movie pose no threat whatsoever. Later that night, Preston gets a visit from Chris in person, so he decides to change into the Salmon Date shirt. Chris shows up with the booze, and they're both set. I stopped by at Willie's bar first. I met Charlie. What a character. <laughs> yeah, well, that's how the writers intended him. As the two of them chat, Chris asks Preston why he's staying in a neighborhood like this. I didn't feel like going back for a crime I didn't commit. I know you didn't do it. I would have testified. What? What about all that you were saying about having no choice but running away? No friendly witnesses. No tape. No choice. And saxophone music and fade out. The next day, Chris decides to do some snooping around the bank and finds the incriminating records. She's about to make her way out when she comes across Goldilocks again. Let's see what totally inane way they can take him out this time. <laughs> Curse those impenetrable elevator doors! This leads to a car chase with Tommy at the wheel. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god, no! And obligatory car explosion. Blondie thinks that Chris is dead and the records are destroyed, which is good news for him since he didn't have to do any actual work. In reality, Chris and Tommy escaped just before the explosion. Yeah, they really had time to escape that one. Preston gets a call from Tommy about the accident and he rushes to see Chris at the hospital. Chris? Preston? Aw, oh, psych! What the hell happened? That's a good question, seeing as how she seems uninjured. Maybe she didn't get seriously hurt when the car flipped, but then why would she have a room at the hospital? Look, Chris, these aren't the streets of LA. Those streets you know, these you don't. I'm pretty sure a shootout car chase wouldn't end well regardless of the country, Preston. Chris tells him about Boontow, explaining that the henchmen she fought are the same ones after Tommy. You don't mean Blondie. Holy cats! When Tommy shows up again, the two of them need to protect him. You don't believe this crap, do you? Well, I believe your swearing was poorly dubbed in just there. Despite his brilliant hiding place of drawer in his office desk, Tommy's father is surprised to find the records missing. When Tommy, Chris, and Preston show up to confront him, they find that someone else has gotten there first. Oh my god! Yeah, check his pulse. I'm sure he's fine. Tommy puts on his best whiny face, and the three of them go after Boontow. I love Boontow now. I feel fine because the diamonds are mine. <laughs> Our gang is hot on Boontow's trail and they arrive by helicopter, completely unnoticed. They're taken to Boontow and he proceeds to do what he knows best, hamming it up. <laughs> oink oink, motherfuckers! It's just me as you really fucking crazy. You're under arrest. <laughs> That scared him. <laughs> yeah, way to go, Cynthia. Instead of, like, you know, killing them, which would make sense since he has no real reason to keep them alive, Boontow holds them at gunpoint until Blondie shows up and Tommy gives them an ultimatum. Press him to a fight. Press him once you let us go. Yeah, sure, sounds like a plan, except, um, why would he let you go? Wow, epic fight between Preston and Blondie. We haven't seen this since Preston totally kicked his ass. Hey, I'm completely surprised he totally kicked his ass again. Guess Boontow has no choice but to let them go now. Or him and all his guys can be shot by Dazzo's gang, that works too. Now we finally get to see Dazzo himself. <laughs> Tommy? Really? 
The guy that Preston totally handed his ass to earlier? <laughs> oh, I'm just gonna be rich. I'm the boss. <laughs> I created Donzo. You know how long it took me just to come up with the right name? I wanted something uh, snappy, scary, you know? Great marketing idea, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> We're supposed to be scared of him? <laughs> oh. Oh, well, I look forward to his inevitable defeat. Okay, so in summary, Tommy wanted the diamonds for himself, and he's a great big weenie. Preston and Chris are locked up together, and instead of just shooting them, Tommy goes for the wily coyote technique of leaving a bomb outside their window. <laughs> and oh look, Chris and Preston escape. Should have thought that one through, Tommy. The boy wonder goes to sell the diamonds, but he double crosses them. So he takes the cash and the diamonds, and they just fly away? Impressive criminals there. Yeah! Woo! Cue the ass handage. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, Tommy is no match for Preston and is easily defeated before the police show up. He's a criminal mastermind. Was it worth it? <laughs> what a little shit. So Chris and Preston discuss what's next, and Preston decides to go back to LA and clear his name, something that they inexplicably didn't consider in the first movie. And he has the perfect funds to open up a new bar. <laughs> Ta-da! So was Rage and Honor 2 a good sequel? Well, it wasn't bad. I liked the continuation with the characters, the fight scenes were better choreographed, and Boontao was a lot of fun. The final battle could have used some work, and the other bad guys were less than stellar, but it didn't leave me feeling like I wasted my time. If you like part one, this is a good follow-up. So let's get back to spectacularly shitty movie, shall we? See it, Sheriff? Yeah, I see it. Damn that broken right. What do you want us to do, Sheriff? Call a dog catcher. 